pass it on to Manuel Colon, who's our wonderful partner from Inflection. Manuel, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Vela. I really appreciate being here and thank you to the entire Monterey County Office of Education team. Um, you truly have been amazing in, 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 the, in, in the journey that we're all taking, right? We, we all uh, jumped all in uh, as we embarked in the implementation of community schools and believe in this effort and believe in the outcomes that we're trying to, to, to achieve. And so uh, I value our relationship and our partnership and uh, just see the great work that's being done around the Central Coast. Um, so with that, I want to welcome everybody to our first workshop of, of a series. And, and, and just thank you, you know, ahead of time for, for the great work that you're doing as, as, we, as we embark in, 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 in the initial uh, workshop. It is very exciting to see um, that throughout the state of California, um, everybody's really uh, being very mindful uh, not only of ensuring the success of the implementation, uh, but really ensuring that we're providing the best support and resources uh, to our students. I mean, at the end of the day, that is why we're here. We're here for our students. So um, my name is Manuel Colon, as I shared. I will be facilitating today's workshop, but with me, I have an amazing team that will also be kind of behind the scenes uh, both in, in, in facilitation, but also in ensuring that you have all your questions answered uh, in the chat and with uh, the resources being posted and, and all of that. So um, you are in for a treat and hopefully you'll be taking away many, many resources that you can use both at the site level or at the county level or the work that you're doing moving forward. Um, so with me today is uh, uh, Alexa, uh, uh, at HLs, who is one of our facilitators, so just wave Alexa. And then we also have uh, Michelle uh, Leibart, who is another one of our facilitators. And we have Elise Kuikendo, who is our Director of Partnerships Development, who is also here to support. So you'll see them throughout, um, but I wanted you to see that they were also here. Um, I wanted to start by kind of telling you a little bit about myself, uh, one, because We'll be engaging in a lot of conversation. I'll be seeing you uh, probably in person soon, but you know maybe even sooner. Um, as I shared, uh, I've been in education now for gosh over thirty years. Um, recently retired from the Anaheim Union High School District, uh, and the Anaheim Union High School District uh, has been a leader in the movement around community schools. Um, we have uh, currently uh, have fifteen community schools implemented. And um, a lot of the work that has been done has been taken uh, a while. It hasn't happened overnight, as you will see, but you have seen the results or you'll see the results of that work. And so for the last uh, over 20 years, I've been in the Anaheim Union High School District as a teacher, as a uh, site level administrator. I was a junior high principal, a senior high principal. And then the last eight years, I was the assistant superintendent, chief academic officer. And so the work that you'll see throughout the, the four workshops really is a, a labor of love for me because it's been the work that we've been doing both in the Anaheim High School District and in the sites that I've worked at. Um, so I'm super excited to be here and, and, and share. Uh, and as Dr. Vela said, the expertise is in the room. Nobody's coming with all the right answers, as you know, if, with the implementation of community schools. Uh, but hopefully we can all make sense of it together and we can really see the benefit um, that is with the intention of community schools. Um, so today's workshop really will be a foundation to the work. Um, we are going to start with really looking at uh, what does it mean uh, when it comes to community schools uh, as we start to, to really step by step build our, our capacity um, for and towards the implementation. Um, and so for today's work really will be foundational. Um, we're gonna engage in a lot of conversation uh, about what this means. Um, we're gonna learn from each other and we're gonna be reflecting. We're gonna be reflecting as to what does it mean for me uh, moving forward. Um, so with that, if you don't mind as you are looking at uh, or as you're putting your names in the chat, 
um, or in, in your, in your, um, on your screen, uh, if you don't mind adding the school that you're coming from or the organization that you're representing, um, it will help with conversation. It will help with question and answer, et cetera. And so this again uh, is a learning community. Um, we're all here in it together. And, and so the intent really is to engage um, together in, in, in the concepts and the, in the, and the topics. Um, so with that, Alexa, the agenda for today really is about uh, giving us an overview of community schools, assessing an existing, uh, assessing a, a, a existing structures and, and instructional initiatives. Uh, really, again, you know, as we think about the implementation of communities, because we have to think about it as, as there are foundations. If we do not have clear foundations, uh, it's going to be difficult for us to move forward in the implementation. So really, what does that foundation look like? Uh, how can we support both at the site level or at the county level or at the district level um, this foundation? So when we get started or as we continue to do the implementation, uh, that we're doing it right. So we'll talk through uh, not only uh, the community schools framework, but also what are those key components that need to be in place as we move forward with the implementation. Um, our objectives for today really are uh, to have an understanding of, of the work that we are doing with the implementation of the framework and really to equip us uh, to assess our school's existing structures and instructional initiatives as we continue to align them um, and then be very intentional with the next steps. Uh, that, is, that is what we're gonna try to achieve in, in, in two hours. We are gonna give you a small break because I know that doing this virtually is not always the best, but we, we, we know that this is, this is how we do things in the 21st century, right? And so um, we will give you a small break for us to take a stretch break and then come back and continue the work. Um, so with that, um, I want to also really be mindful of the norms um, because as anything with, with any time we come together as a learning community, we really have to be uh, both present uh, and, and understand you know, our, 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 our rules of engagement. Um, but these are just some, I know we, we, can, we can list more, but, but we invite you to practice creative courage. And, and we truly mean that because community schools you know, does take a lot of courage, as many of you already know. And so we really want to be mindful um, that we are present, that we are all in it together. Um, and so practicing that creative courage uh, as it relates to our, our implementation of community schools is, is going to be important. Um, to be the crew and not the passenger. Um, I know there's a lot of things that are going on on our plates at this moment, um, but really being mindful and being present, um, being the crew, being the active participant that we need as we engage with the topics and as we engage with each other. We're gonna learn from each other. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna share best practices that are working. And so it's gonna be important that we are, that we are active. Um, and then ask questions, you know, Somebody's going to be, it's going to have the answers in the chat. Somebody's going to be, have the answer within the room. Um, but ask the questions as they come up. Uh, don't hesitate to, to, to be reflective. Don't hesitate to ask. Um, and like I said, this is, this is all a learning process for all of us. So thank you with that. Um, this is a quote that I believe will set the stage. Um, you know, when we think about community schools, we know that there is a framework that we follow, but we also know that at the end of the day, it really is about the day-to-day -day work. It is about uh, how it's transforming itself within our schools, how it's making a difference for our students. And so when we think about uh, the work, um, we have to start with that reality. We have to start with the reality of, of, of the impact that we're having in the classrooms and the impact that we're having with our students. So let's keep that in mind, um, that that's our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is to have that impact uh, 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 lead to our student outcomes. So we want to start with the why. Um, like anything, you know, we need to have a shared purpose. We need to have an under shared understanding. 
And so what I want to do now as we get our juices flowing is I want us to take about a minute to just think, not necessarily put in the chat quite yet, but I want us to just think. And I'm not sure if the screen. Mm -mm. Oh, can we go? Yeah. Is it possible? There we go. Yay. <laughs> let's take a, let's take a, just, let's take 30 seconds. Oh. All right. Let's take 30 seconds just to think. Um, why are community schools important? Why are community schools important? Let's just take 30 seconds before we, we write in the chat. Hey, go ahead and put into the chat, why are community schools important to you? They serve the whole child, the whole child approach. They address the inequities. We will need together to support all students and families, absolutely. Community school serves as a model that truly embraces the voices and needs of all. includes parent student voice. Meslo and Bloom, absolutely. Help diminish disparities. support the student and school community. Oh, child. Collaborative leadership structure. Take a whole family approach to education. Beautiful. Please continue to put your thoughts into the chat. Absolutely. It is important, it's critical that we all understand why we are doing this work. And as we work with our, our communities, as we work with our teams, uh, it is important that we start with the why. Why is it that we're doing this work? Why community schools? Why now? And 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 as we as we you know, as we work together, we have to have that shared purpose. That's where we start. If we can't get beyond, if we can't understand. Uh, it is critical and important that we understand with the why. It's about the whole child. It's about ensuring that everything that we do is leading to our students being successful. 
And, and, and I think that that's what uh, many times that, that as we look into, you know, why people are struggling with community schools um, is because we haven't centered ourselves around this shared purpose. We haven't centered ourselves in, in you know, what, what is it that we're trying to achieve? Um, and it's about the whole child. When we think about the whole child, we're thinking about everything that relates to the school. Community schools isn't a separate program. And I think all of us, you know, know that, that it isn't a separate program. It isn't something that we're doing aside from what we're doing every day in the classroom. And so as we think about the why behind community schools, uh, it is everything that we do. And, and it's a mindset. It's a mindset that we're in, in an approach that we're taking towards serving our students and our families. And so, and so I wanted to start here because this is, this is the conversation that we all need to have as we're moving forward and we're being charged uh, as a community to, to implement. Um, we need to be the first ones to understand the why behind the implementation. And so, and so I hope that, that not only as you're reading all of the different comments that were put in, but that we are reflecting constantly uh, with, with the shared purpose. Um, so with that, I'm gonna show a, a quick video um, just to kind of set the stage. And this is a video that many of you may have already seen, but it sets the stage for us to have a common understanding, uh, a common understanding about community schools, a common understanding about the approach, uh, and a common understanding of the intent uh, of what we're trying to achieve. Go ahead. What makes a school a great school? Caring for the whole child. Expanding the horizons of learning. Building relationships with families. Working together to realize a shared vision. This is the school every student needs. This is a community school. Community schools are public schools that partner with stakeholders to create the conditions students need to thrive. Community schools can be found across the United States and their numbers are growing fast. But what exactly makes a school a community school? They integrate student supports. Clinics, counselors, and other services ensure each and every student is ready to learn. They expand and enrich learning. Extended school days, summer programs, and real-world experiences help students reach their full potential. They engage families and communities. Partnering with residents to identify and meet community needs makes everyone feel safe, welcome, and involved in school. They lead in collaboration. Inclusive decision-making and peer learning builds trust among students, educators, families, and communities. When a school stands on these four pillars, it's a community school. Research supports this four-pillar approach, but there's no one-size-fits-all model. Every community school is different because each community is different. Figuring out what it looks like in your community starts by getting actual community members involved. That's the full-time job of community school coordinators. They're the human bridge connecting all the partners and stakeholders that make community schools possible. So that's what makes a school a community school. Now how do you pay for it? Startup costs like hiring a full-time coordinator can be raised from foundations or state and local governments. Tapping into existing funding and partnering with local businesses can bring in service providers. Sharing resources and staff with partners can help everyone do more. And as a community school becomes more established, leaders can advocate for budgets that sustain their impact and new funding to expand it. Every community school is different. What will yours be like? Get started. Thank you. So as you think about the and reflect on on the video and I and like I said, it's it's really made to be meant to be foundational and meant to really think about um, you know what are the key components. Um, I want you to uh, in the chat, uh, what would you what will your community school look like? 
So be reflective about, um, you know, maybe you are just doing a planning grant at the moment. Maybe you are already doing implementation. Maybe you're supporting schools and districts with that uh, planning and implementation. Um, but what will you your community school look like? So so be visionary as to you as to thinking about what would that look like. So go ahead in the chat if you don't mind reflecting on what will your community school look like. Thank you. Aging and welcoming, where parents feel welcomed, safe place for everybody. Focus on the needs of students and families. Beautiful. Resources. Where families feel welcome and heard. Absolutely. Attendance will be improved. Authentic family and community engagement, yes. Beautiful. Keep putting your comments in the chat as you as you are thinking about them or as you are adding to it. Um, welcoming, supportive, resourceful, and empowering. Absolutely. Absolutely. All of these are great, great visions. I think um, you know it's important for us to understand where we are headed. Um, and, and what it is that we're trying to accomplish um, and doing it uh, collectively, collaboratively, um, and, and really understanding the intent and really understanding the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. And so you hit it right on, right, as, as you're describing uh, the community school that we all want to have. Um, so with that, I want to take us back to the, the framework. Um, because I think it's very, very critical. The framework is very clear in terms of the intent. Uh, the framework is the what of what we're trying to do, but it's very clear. It's, you know, there isn't any deviation from it. So it's important for us to understand um, that it is the guide. It is the, it is the what of what we're trying to do. The how is what we're trying to all accomplish. And the how is what we are here to discuss. The how is, is what we're here to make sense of. But um, you know, the, the, the community schools framework uh, really is, is very clear in, in, in its intent. So this is a quote that I took out from the framework. To meet the current moment, it is important not to view community schools as a one initiative among many initiatives uh, that are currently being funded in California districts, but rather as an equity enhancing strategy that aligns with, the can that, that aligns with and can help coordinate and extend a wide range of state, school, and district initiatives. And, and as I said before, um, we have to look at community schools as the, as the big umbrella. We have to look at community schools that this is the work that we're trying to do, that everything is aligned uh, uh, through the community schools uh, in, uh, implementation, and that it should not feel like another, another, uh, another thing, um, that it is the work that we're all trying to achieve. 
Um, I'm really excited to share, um, and hopefully you've already seen uh, an article that came out recently, 20 years and 10 lessons, community schools and as an equitable school improvement strategy. Um, this article probably is the single most important that I would say uh, to really understand the why behind community schools. Um, you know, the, the people that 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 um, have been doing the work for many years um, uh, and understand what they, you know, what they've done, what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, really, you know, it took the time to 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 express um, and be intentional about their learning. Um, so Jane Quinn and Martin Blank uh, are, are, are the pioneers behind community schools. And so in the article, they talk about the history um, and then they give us 10 lessons that, that really will allow us to reflect. Um, here's where the research came together to talk about why the four pillars, you know, we keep talking about the four pillars and, and much of today's work is gonna be the four pillars. Um, but they they go beyond that and 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 they really dig deep into 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 the why behind the implementation and the and what we're trying to achieve. Um, but the good thing in terms of the research um, that everything that they found it all led back to to the four pillars and and why they're so important in terms of the implementation. The other thing that they really highlight and double down on. Is that is that this the community schools strategy is not a quick fix, uh, but rather a long term strategy. And and I and I and again I don't I want to keep reinforcing that because as I work with districts across the state, um, everybody constantly wants to do everything at the same time, right? We have the five, four by fours and we all want to do them all at the same time. Um, but the reality is, is that this is a long game. This is something that is going to be, it's not a quick fix. It's going to take time. So we have to be very intentional with where do we, where do we begin, uh, where we begin and, and then what our next steps are going to be. So, so what, what I really appreciate about this article is that it lays the foundation. It allows us to breathe. It allows us to really understand um, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but it also leads us into, into the work. Um, and so I hope you take the time to read this article. I also hope that you take the time to share with your colleagues, your teams, especially if you're here as a team from a specific school. Um, this is a foundational piece to help people understand the work that needs to happen and the, need, the work that needs to be done. And so again, uh, I, I would say this is, this is foundational. So as we move forward into the work, and into the four pillars, because the four pillars were clear. The 20 years, um, they said they've, they've done massive amount of research and it's all led to, to, to the four pillars. So I want us to really double down on the four pillars and really go deep with understanding because they are foundational. So as I shared with you at the beginning of, of today's uh, workshop is, is that the, the, the outcomes of today is foundational. We wanna begin with where we need to be what are the things that we need to have in place as we start to move forward to in, in, in doing the work? Um, and so with that, I'm going to have uh, Alexa come on and, and walk you through the different tools that we will be using um, as we move forward through the workshop. Alexa? Yes, thank you, Manuel. Hello, everybody. Now the time to lean back onto our norms. We're going to ask you all to be the crew, not the passenger on this one, and definitely practice that creative courage. So first and foremost, this is what's going to happen. Manuel is going to eloquently take us through each and every single protocol. So um, it's going to be broken down into the four sections. So we'll go one by one by one. We'll learn a little bit about each of the four pillars. And then what's going to happen after Manuel shares some of his expertise about each individual pillar, what we are going to ask for you all to do is share what has worked for you and take inspiration from what others have learned around the four pillars. All right, so what we want you all to do right now is get these tabs, get your tabs organized. If you're not a tabs person, maybe you wanna um, scan the QR code um, because we are going to be utilizing this retro board 
um, throughout the entire, uh, for the rest of the presentation. So this is what our retro board looks like. And as Manuel goes by each one, you're gonna have the opportunity as a collective to reflect what you're already doing, what is already working for you within those four pillars, okay? And so once you get into the retro board, all you have to do to add your comments is click this awesome little plus button. You're gonna click that. You're gonna type it in there and you're gonna press save. If, for example, somebody says something that resonates with you, here's the emoji right here. You can go ahead and put the fire sign, the heart sign to showcase that you agree. And if you want to continue to add on to that conversation, feel free to click the uh, thought bubble right here and you can add on to the conversation. All right. So that is the first tab that we need you to have open for the remainder of the presentation. The second tab is we are going to have you all uh, do a self-assessment, okay? So again, if you like your tabs, you can organize your tabs all well. Um, the link is in the chat for you to click. You're going to make a copy of your self-assessment document, or if you want to work off your cell phone, that's fine too. Go ahead and scan the QR code, especially if you're sharing a computer screen. We really want the self-assessment to be something that you are doing individually. That is really important. So if you are sharing your own, uh, sharing a screen, be sure that um, each person has access to their own self-assessment document. Um, and then you'll be reflecting there. Um, we'll open the stage for any questions. Um, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let us know. Great, thank you, Alexa. Really appreciate you giving us the the uh, the step by step in terms of where we all need to be. So hopefully, everybody got those two open. Um, again, this is a process, and and as we as we reflect through each of them, it's important for us to learn from each other, um, and and it's important for us to also do our self uh, uh, reflection um, um, for for us to be able to take that away. So again, make sure that everybody is there and everybody has their their items open, and we'll go ahead and and start. Did we get all the questions answered? Yes, there was just one person in the chat who uh, needed the QR code. So I'm just leaving it up there. Um, yep. And then I think it should pop up on the others as well. I believe we have it up there for um, the subsequent slides. Great, thank you, Alexa. And I'm not sure if, uh, if there's anything we can do about the these squares that keep popping up, but we'll work with it. Um, so as I shared with you earlier, there's there's a couple of things that need to be in place. I think the first thing um, is 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 having a common understanding, a common purpose uh, of what it is that we're trying to do. And I think all of you beautifully put that into the chat uh, and 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 why we are doing what we're doing. The second thing um, that's important in terms of foundational pieces is understanding that the research is very clear. The research led us back to the four pillars. And the four pillars, there's reason why each of those were important in terms of the implementation. And it's also why they're so important and so prominent in the, um, in, in, in the framework. Um, and so as we think about each of these, um, with integrated student supports, um, I really love this, this quote in the, it, it, and it's you know, lesson six in the, in the, in the 20 years, 10 lessons. A good student support system cannot compensate for a weak core instructional program. This could not be more true. Um, we have to be very mindful that when we're talking about the integrated student supports, that we're talking about the classroom and that we're talking about, um, uh, again, uh, the, 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 the instructional practice, the pedagogy that, that is being implemented. And so for us, it's, it's important that we, that we are uh, framing community schools as the classroom. Um, in many of our implementation districts, um, there's a there's a teacher component that has been added um, because it's so important that we ensure that everything that we are doing starts in the classroom. Um, and so and so as we think about student uh, integrated student supports, we're talking about everything. You know, some of you already put that into the chat. It's a whole child education. It's wraparound services anything that's gonna help our students be successful. The ultimate goal of community schools 
as it states in the framework, the ultimate goal is to ensure that our students are college, career, and life ready, that our students have opportunities beyond high school to be successful. That's the ultimate goal. So we're thinking that that's the ultimate goal, then how do we backwards map from that ultimate goal uh, within our daily day structures and our day to day actions that we are doing? So when we think about student integrated student supports, we're thinking about that whole child. We're thinking about all the things that are going to be that are that are necessary um, for that student to be successful. And, and so we're talking about the physical. We're talking about the academic. We're talking about the social emotional. We're talking about the mental health. We're talking about all of these things in coordination. And, and, and so that's why I'm saying when we think about community schools, it's not a separate program. It's everything that we do because everything has to be coordinated. Everything has to be intentional um, with, with that support. The other thing that it's important for us to know within the, the integrated student supports is that we need to know every student by name, need, and story. Know our students by name, need, and story. When we do that, we're able to better serve. We're able to better provide the, cert, the resources that are, that are needed for the student. And so, and so integrated student support is very, very critical uh, as a key component, as a key pillar um, for the implementation of community schools. And so, and so I hope that um, as we begin the four pillars, that, that, um, that I was able to share um, the, 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 the intent, the mindset that is required um, specifically with the integrated student supports. Um, what I want you to do now is I want you to go into your retro board and I want you to go in and, and, and just start to describe what are the key things that either you're doing or you are observing schools doing as it relates to integrated supports. What are those best practices? What are those things that are helping our students be successful? When we're talking about a whole child approach, when we're talking about a wraparound approach, what does that mean? So in the retro board, go ahead and start listing all of the things that you believe and us collectively believe belong in integrated supports. So let's take a few minutes to go in there and and again collectively what do what do what are we seeing um, happen around integrated student supports? I'm going to give ourselves about five minutes because we really need to be mindful and, and thoughtful about what we mean by integrated student supports. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is what are we seeing when it when it comes to academics? What do students need? 
day to day to be successful. Beautiful. Yes. Excellent. And please respond to each other as well. These are amazing ideas. Good thinking. Remember, it's about coordination of services. Yes. Okay, let's take a, about another minute. This is amazing. Now you'll continue to have access to this. So when you come back to it, as you're thinking about it, as you're working with your teams, these are all the ideas that you can refer to. Excellent. All right. So what we need you to do now, what I want you to do now is I want you to now go back to your, 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 your self-assessment. Okay. And this is going to be critical. And this is again, a tool that you can, that you can use and that you'll be taking away. Um, in the top part of your self-assessment, it asks you to describe your current status as it relates to integrated student support. You, you just saw an example of the entire group. Everybody in there is talking and, and, and describing the different types of services that are involved in integrated student supports, okay? In this part, I want you to you know, reflect on what is it that you're doing specifically to your site or specifically to your program. Um, I don't want you to do it necessarily at this moment because I want you to reflect on the on the on the, on the next questions. Um, this is something that you can go back to and 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 do an inventory of of where you're at. So what I want you to do now, and again, this is independent in your self assessment. I want you to think about you know what resonated with you as you as you as you not only you know thought about integrated student support, but when you saw all those examples. What is challenging your thinking as it relates to uh, integrated student supports and what can serve as inspiration for your work? I want you to pick two of the three questions and then I want you to respond to those two of the three questions. So take a couple minutes to do that. And please, if, if there's anything, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat and we will respond to it but we want to make sure that everybody's into it in their uh, self-assessment i'm going to go ahead and give you um two minutes What is resonating with you? What is challenging your thinking? And what can serve as inspiration for your work?
Okay, take about another 30 seconds to respond to one or two of the questions. All right, excellent. Yeah, again, I think it's really, really important that we're constantly reflecting um, because this is a process. You know, we're constantly processing, we're constantly thinking about what does this mean for me? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for our work? Um, and so it's really important that we are reflecting and that we are learning. You know, we're talking about continuous improvement. Um, and if we don't reflect, um, we're going to continue to make mistakes or, or similar mistakes. So we need to be very reflective and continue to, to ask ourselves what's working, what's not working. What do we need to do differently? We all know the outcome, right? We all have a common purpose. We all know the outcomes that we're trying to achieve in terms of our students. Um, but the day-to-day -day work is, is, is going to be, is gonna be uh, this, this ongoing continuous improvement. Um, so with that, the second piece of this um, is really uh, active family and community engagement. And this is, this is the one that I, I, you know, I love because this is, this is why we, we jumped into the work, right? When we think about active family and community engagement, uh, for many of us, this is where we give each other a high five. We're doing this amazing. We have family and community engagement specialists. We have community engagement, uh, uh, community uh, 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 liaisons. Um, and, and, and so this is something that we, we, we have to pat ourselves on the back if we're doing this really, really well. Um, I think the key thing as it relates both to the, uh, the 20 years and 10 lessons, but also embedded into the, into the, into the, uh, the framework is that community schools takes an acid-based approach and builds on the strengths of communities, schools, and individuals. We can't stress this enough, right? Uh, and I'll read it again because it's so important that community schools takes an acid-based approach and builds on the strengths of communities, schools, and individuals. At the heart of community schools, at the heart of the intent of the law, at the heart of the, of the, of the framework is this. And so again, if there's something that you take away, this is what we're trying to achieve. Uh, as it relates to, to, to the work we do on a daily basis. Um, and so the question becomes is, how do we do this? How do we ensure that this happens? If we continue to look at family community engagements as a separate thing, it's never gonna happen. If we continue to think that community family community engagement is a person or an individual who's doing the work, it's never gonna happen. Okay? It's all of our responsibilities. It's all of our responsibilities to ensure that this is happening everywhere on our, on our campuses, okay? For community schools to work well and for community schools to you know, fully uh, uh, realize, um, we have to start here. It has to be the conversations that we're having. So with family and community engagement, we're talking about family expertise. We're talking about uh, uh, how do we bring in that expertise that our, fam that our students and families uh, have uh, and bringing it into the classroom. Um, I was just at the Gabe conference um, this past week. Hopefully, some of you were there as well. Just saw the the amazing work that's being done uh, across the, the 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 California for multilingual students and plurilingual students. And 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 this was the foundation of that. The foundation was, you know, we need to value the assets, specifically the cultural and linguistic assets that our students are bringing to to our schools. Um, you know, the work that that we we think of a family community engagement, um, you know, it was about let's do this workshop or let's bring the parents. Yes, it is part of that. But but where we have to take it to another level is we have to take it to the leadership, the advocacy, the ensuring that our families and our parents and our community feels like they are part of the answer, that they are part of the work that we're trying to do that they are partners in the education, but also partners in, 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 in the solutions that we're trying to achieve. Um, and, so, and so when we think about all that, we have to be mindful uh, of, of, of the how. How are we doing this? And, and, and like I said, it cannot be a, a person who is solely responsible for doing this. It has to be a team effort. It has to be a collective effort. Um, and, so, and so we, you know, we have to be that we have to be intentional 
of, of not only the engagement, but also how are we bringing this into the classroom? It goes back to the teacher, right? What type of professional development are we providing or professional learning are we providing for our teachers uh, to ensure that this is happening? This is going to take a little bit of time. I will tell you, this is going to take a little bit of time. We have to lay foundation. We have to make sure that everybody understands the why behind community schools. We have to make sure that systems and structures are in place to be able to go. You know what I mean? And then, and then once we get all those things in place, we, we, we need to begin to understand how we are doing this and how we're measuring that we're doing this. Um, it's critical, critical, critical that we, that we understand that. So again, it's about advocacy. It's about empowerment. It's about partnership um, with our family and community. So with that, I want us now to reflect as a group collectively. When we think about family and community engagement, what are those best practices that we're seeing out there, either that we're doing at, at our current sites or that we're observing other schools doing uh, uh, in, the, in, in the area that we're working in or ideas that we have to how to, on how to build this? How do we build this within, um, within our plan, okay? So let's go back to the retro board and let's start to, to, to brainstorm. How are we ensuring that family and community engagement is alive and real in our community schools? What does that look like? Beautiful. And I'm gonna give us five minutes. Yay, I love that. Authentic, right? It's two-way communication, absolutely. I love that. It's a priority, it has to be a priority. Yes. I go back to that authenticity. Thank you for bringing up empathy interviews. It's a great way to, to engage and understand. Yes, co-create family events. Parents want to be involved, want to be engaged. Yes. What else? We are doing a lot of amazing things with our parents and families. How are you, how are you organizing? Is there a team approach to family and community engagement in your experiences? And if there is, what does that look like? It's important for us to see examples.
Okay, we'll take about one more minute. Beautiful. All right. What I want you to do now is that I want you to go back to your um, self-assessment and go to um, go to uh, family and community engagement. And now I want you to reflect. Pick one of the three questions. Pick two of the three uh, questions. Uh, what resonated with you? What is challenging your thinking? And what can serve as inspiration for your work? Pick two of those and respond to them, please. Give you a couple minutes. And again, if you have any questions or you're having trouble getting into your, your two links, um, go ahead and put it in the chat and somebody will help you. It's really important that you have access to all of this. And remember, all the work that we're doing today is going to help with your implementation plan, is going to help with your APR, is going to help with everything that you're having to do as part of that. This is, this is the work. This is the how. Okay, we'll take another 30 seconds to reflect. All right, excellent. Okay, we got through two of the four pillars. Um, and again, I want us to be mindful that that we are letting, laying down the foundation for understanding the work that we have to do. We understand we need to understand the why, um, which is our purpose. We need to understand the what, which is the the framework. And then we need to understand the how, which is the work we're going to be doing. Okay? That's the process. And we also need to understand that this is going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. And we're not going to be able to do everything all at once. We need to be very intentional with what we do first, what we do second, what we do third, as we're building uh, sustainability and as we're building into transformation. We're not going to get to transformation uh, unless we've put some, some, some key things in place. So with that, I'm going to give you a quick five minute stretch break. And so the timer is on five minutes. Um, so go ahead and, and uh, take a quick drink of water, whatever you need, uh, five minutes and we'll come back in five minutes. So the timer is up. We'll see you in five minutes. All right. I asked everybody to take a quick stretch break and I didn't, I didn't have a chance to stretch so. All right. Are we all getting back? Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's always nice to get a, a quick mind break, right? All right. Are we all good to continue? Thumbs up. Awesome. Um, so moving on to uh, the third pillar, and the third pillar, collaborative leadership practices. Um, for this uh, pillar, uh, we refer back to lesson seven of 10 years, 10 lessons, and lesson eight. Uh, lesson seven states that practitioners, educators, and their community partners benefit from coaching, consultation, and other forms of professional development as they shift from, uh, their practice in the direction of community schools. 
And and really what what this means is that you know we're all in we're all partners. We're all partners in education. We're all partners together. Um, we all collectively, collaboratively um, build on what we are learning. Um, and and we all have something to contribute. And so it's really, really important that we're mindful of that. Uh, lesson eight is committed collaborative local leadership is fundamental to the growth, sustainability, and effectiveness of community schools. Um, I, I can't stress it enough. The role of the principal is critical. Uh, and I'm going to say it again. The role of the principal is critical. Uh, in the implementation of community schools. And so as we think about what that means, um, we have to understand that uh, that they are the they, you know, they are the ones who 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 are going to um, either support and understand and enhance or become part of the barrier in the implementation. And so we really need to understand when we're thinking about collaborative leadership practices, we're thinking about it holistically. We're thinking it. We're we're thinking about it intentionally, um, and 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 we're making efforts to 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 ensure um, that we're in, we are participating in an inclusive environment. Um, and so that's why I say that the principle is so important because the principle sets the tone for that. They set the tone uh, in terms of what that's going to look like. And 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 you know, in in the previous example, we were talking a lot about. Um, we were talking about transparency. We were talking about authenticity. Um, I think in this in this case of collaborative leadership, we also have to use very similar language. We have to use authentic, and we have to use uh, transparent. Um, otherwise, this is not going to work. And every piece of literature that you're going to read around community schools, it's going to mention collaborative leadership. Uh, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. It's because we all need to own the process. We all need to own what happens. We are all part of the solution, and and we all have to we have to understand that. Um, and and there's processes and protocols you can put in place to help people understand and work together. Um, it's not easy. It is not easy to do this. And so it's important for us to really understand that there's a process and that we're 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 learning. And that we're going to be gaining best practices as to how best to do that, and and we do that every single day. We're learning every single day. Um, it's going to take collaborative trust, a huge level of collaborative trust. Um, in the Anaheim Union High School District, we have a district wide community schools uh, uh, um, committee uh, that includes that includes all of the educational partners, and it's and it's facilitated by the, the, the teachers union president and the district community schools coordinator. They're the ones who facilitate it, but everybody has equal voice in the process. They have equal vote in the process and they have a process for, for, for creating consensus. Um, so that collaborative trust is so important. Um, they have a shared responsibility. You know, once you have a, once you have a clear purpose in, in why you're doing what you're doing, um, you have to have that shared responsibility in, in making that happen and making that work. Um, if you truly want to transform the culture and climate of your school, then, then you have to get to that collaborative leadership practice. Uh, again, if you want to get to the transformative piece, transformation, um, you really have to be mindful of, 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 of the intentionality behind it. Um, it's not as simple as just having a committee and checking the box. So I'm going to say that again. It's not as simple as just having a committee checking the box. It's also not as simple as saying, well, we already have school site council, so we're going to just use that school site council as our, as our community schools committee. Again, remember, community schools is everything. Community schools is the whole child. And so it encompasses every aspect of your school. If if you know, if we were to use school site council or another existing group, um, those existing groups already have a function, right? A, a, a school site council has the function to ensure that Title I money gets spent appropriately. There's a certain there's a certain requirement behind that. Or if we're you know looking at another group, they have a certain function. And so and so being very mindful that as you create your collaborative leadership practices. 
um, that there's intentionality behind it, that you have the right people uh, uh, in the room, uh, and that you are ensuring equity of voice and equity of vote within that, that group. Uh, and again, we're going to learn together. We're going to learn best practices together. Okay. So don't feel like you have to have, you have to do it all on your own or that you're going to have, you know, you, you, you're going to be mistake, making mistakes that you're, no, we're all learning together. Okay. But again, we have to start with the right intent. We have to start with the right intent. And as I said at the beginning, the number one person, we have to really be mindful that, that, that our principals are, are on board and owning the process. So let's go back to our retro board and let's think about what do you know what are the collaborative leadership practices that we are seeing across our region. So go ahead and put in uh, what are you doing? Any any great ideas that are happening? How are you ensuring collaborative leadership? How are you ensuring that everybody has voice, that we have inclusion in, in, in the process, that we have transparency in the process? Go ahead and start listing um, your ideas, both what you've seen um, or what you've implemented. Yay. Excellent. Beautiful. People need to understand what they're, why they're doing what they're doing. Yes, there has to be a system behind that, both from the district to the site to the, yes. Think about it from a systemic approach as well. Beautiful. How are you building consensus? If you can please add any ideas of how you build consensus. I think it's important for people to see what those best practices are. How do you build consensus of the teams? How do you ensure equity of voice? That's great. Thank you. Remember, community schools is an approach. It's a mindset. Yes. Any ideas for students? How are we involving students in the process? How are we including them in our community schools advisory councils? Take about another minute. Mm. I love that community circles. A lot of great ideas. Remember, there's power in unity. 
and there's power in shared decision making. It allows for sustainability. Excellent. Okay, thank you for your input. Um, so what we want you to do now is I want you to reflect on, on all the great ideas that you just saw. What does this mean for you, right? Uh, what resonates with you? What is challenging your thinking? And what can serve as inspiration for your work as it relates to collaborative leadership? I'll give you two minutes. Go ahead. Please reflect. Amazing ideas. Yeah, this pillar is probably the one that most people struggle with the most, but it's nice to see many of you feeling like it's your strongest. That's great. Okay, take another 30 seconds. To finish your reflection, remember, pick two of the three questions. Okay, thank you for doing that. So let's move to our last pillar, um, expanded and enrichment learning time and opportunities. Um, this is probably my favorite, and I'll tell you why it's my favorite. Um, community schools is a strategy for supporting student learning and development, not a specific program model. Um, I can't tell you, again, is, you know, we cannot think of community schools as a whole separate thing. So when you, when you think about expanding and enrichment, this is where the equity piece comes in, right? This is equity. When we're talking about, you know, uh, 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 this pillar, we have to be thinking about equity. Um, what are we doing? It was kind of that whole concept of the LCAP, right? The LCAP is, you know, we have we have a, a, a piece uh, that, you know, we have discussions around the whole piece of supplemental and concentration. Um, it's about filling the gap. It's about ensuring that there's opportunities that, um, that otherwise wouldn't be if we didn't have the resources. So thinking about that same mindset, uh, it's, it's, it's really about how do we create opportunities and experience for our students um, that they need to have, okay? And, and, and what I mean by that is that is that if we didn't do that, they wouldn't otherwise have. So, so you know, what are those experiences? So remember, remember what I said in terms of what are the outcomes for, for, for community schools? The outcomes for community schools is to ensure our students have opportunities when they graduate from high school. That's, that's it. We need to make sure that they're ready for college, career, and life. That's the outcomes that we want. And so if that's what we want and that's what we expect, then what kinds of opportunities do we need to provide for them? TK, pre-K, kindergarten through 12th grade. What are those opportunities that we need to create for them to be successful and to be ready for life, to be ready for, for career, to be ready for, for, for college? Um, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about very intentional academic supports, right? If that is a gap that we need to fill, then what types of academic supports are we providing, okay? Um, what types of enrichment, enrichment are we providing? I'm not talking about remediation. I'm talking about enrichment. What type of enrichment are we providing? Again, providing students that opportunity. We're providing uh, internships. We're providing experiences. We're providing um, uh, things that kids are passionate about. Um, what are those things that we are thinking about? Uh, it, in, the, in the statue and, and all over the literature around community schools, 
Uh, it talks about real world experiences. Um, you know, what are those real world experiences that we're giving them? Our kids need to feel like their education is relevant. They need to feel like what they're learning is relevant, that is leading them towards something. Um, and so when we think about expanded and enrichment learning time and opportunities, think about equity, think about opportunity, think about enrichment, think about things that kids need to be able to experience to be successful um, beyond. And we're, we're talking about ex extended and expanded. Yes, we're talking about before and after school, we're talking about summer, we're talking about other options, but, but this is also where we're talking about the classroom. So think about how are you ensuring that these opportunities are also making their way into the classroom? Are we ensuring access and equity to CTE pathways? Are we creating pathways that our students are interested in? Are we giving our students internship opportunities? Are we bringing you know, uh, uh, the assets of our community into the classrooms? All of this is part of this. It's it's really thinking about, um, you know, what if, if I if I if if money wasn't an issue and 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 time wasn't an issue and what what would make our students successful moving forward in life, right? It gets to that point of those experiences. So if you think about it from that perspective, then you're going to be creative about what these opportunities are going to be. Okay. Um, be careful just to throw money at things. Be careful just to say, um, well, we're going to do this and do this and do this and do this and, 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 and nobody shows up, okay? And you're spending all this money on. Be careful with that. That's where your community schools advisory committee comes in because you're doing an asset and, and, and needs assessment. You're finding out what those interests are. You're finding out what you believe is going to help our students uh, uh, be successful. And so, and so when you're thinking about these expanded enrichment uh, opportunities, uh, it is about intentionality and it is about uh, 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 your local, your local context. Okay. So, so be very mindful. Um, do not just throw money at things. Do not think it's just going to be because you got it. So we're going to use it or you've been doing it. So now you're going to spend community schools money on it. No, be intentional about how you're going to use your resources um, as it relates to this, because it is about those ex those 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 opportunities. Um, so with that, um, we're going to go into our retro board, and I want us to be very very uh, uh, thoughtful about what types of experiences do we want to provide for our students um, to get them ready for life. What does that look like? Beautiful. So go ahead and, and start filling that out. And putting all those like, great ideas that either you've already thought about or you're learning about or you've implemented that you want others to know about. Remember, it's about filling that opportunity gap. It's about giving students opportunities that they otherwise would not have. And this is at all levels, all grades. Yes, project-based opportunities, absolutely. Internships, the arts, absolutely. We have a lot of great partnerships out there that can support with this. using current resources you have as well, absolutely.
also think about expectations, skills that you want your students to have when they leave your campuses. It doesn't matter whether they're elementary, middle, or high. Beautiful. Focus on opportunities. Real world experiences. Yes, PBL. I can't tell you how impactful that is as a strategy for our students. Take another minute. Yes, many of these things don't cost anything. I agree. This is where the sustainability comes in. If you do this right and you establish great partnerships, this is it's going to be sustainable. Think about using community schools as seed money for some of these things. But then how are you going to sustain it? Beautiful. Thank you. Great ideas. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Okay, so now we have a whole bunch of great ideas that were taken away as it relates to extended learning time and opportunities. Hopefully, um, we've been able to clarify what this means and, and the intent is. Um, at this time, go ahead and go into your self-assessment and reflection um, and answer two of the three questions. What resonated with you? Uh, what is challenging your thinking? And what can serve as inspiration for your work as it relates to extended learning time and opportunities? Take a couple minutes to do that. I'll put the timer. Wow, great ideas. And hopefully you're realizing that we're creating an inventory. And very similarly, you want to do that um, within your own um, district or site. Okay. Take another 30 seconds to finish up your thought and reflection. All right. So these are the four pillars um, that we all talk about uh, as they relate to community schools. And, and hopefully um, you had a chance to reflect. Hopefully um, they're making more sense because when we think about community schools, it always comes down back to the four pillars. But many times we don't understand the why or we don't understand what it means. Um, hopefully you've had an opportunity to, to see what others are doing or what others are thinking. Um, uh, but I, what I want to emphasize is that, is that we, we have to be very mindful that everything can't happen at once. Um, and I love this graphic. Um, it, it really illustrates community schools at its best. And, and like I said, as I've been meeting with districts and schools across California, um, they feel overwhelmed. They feel like there's too much to do. They feel like, oh my God, where do I begin? And it's because you're right, there's a lot and there's a lot of things that we can be doing, 
And we feel like, you know, if we don't do them all at once, then we, we're not doing our job or we're not meeting the goals of the of, of the community schools. And so I hope that you, you know, you can take away this image. Um, you know, we have large rocks, we have pebbles and we have sand. If we try to shove it all in at once, it's not going to fit. It's not going to fit. As much as we try to make it work, it's not going to fit because we're trying to do it all at once. But if we're intentional and if we really are thoughtful and we put in those big rocks first and then we put in the pebbles and then we put in the sand, guess what? It's going to fit. Okay. And so I want us to be very, very mindful of that, that, that we have to be thinking about a process that we have to be thinking about the long game. Uh, the long game, you know, is is gonna take is gonna take time. And that is why the grant is five years. They didn't give it to you in a year and say it's gonna be done in two years. It's five years and it's because it's gonna take time. The research says it's gonna take time. It's not a quick fix, right? And so and so we have to do things with intentionality. And so I'm hoping that that's a that's a big takeaway of today. Is, is that is is that you know there is a sequence there is timing and there's certain things that we have to have as foundational before we can get to the next things right because things are going to get harder and you'll see in our next couple meetings that we that we come together at um, you're going to see how different we'll be doing it together so you will see the, the the transformation you will see the 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 sequence you will see the uh, the evolution, uh, the organic evolution, um, to hopefully make it a little bit more doable for you because this is doable. Okay, so I wanted to back up a little bit and I want to start with what do we currently have? Okay, we just talked about the the purpose, the why. We just talked about the framework, which includes the 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 four pillars. There's three other four by fours that we're going to talk about in future meetings, um, but but we talked about the framework, uh, and we talked about the the concept that need to be in place as we begin to to lay the foundation. Okay, the thing I don't want you to to lose sight of is that you are already doing a lot of great things. It was evident from from the retro board that you're already doing a lot of great things. So give yourselves credit for everything that you're already doing. The other thing you need to be mindful of is that there's already systems and structures that will help with the implementation of community schools, okay? So I always want to start with assumptions. When I meet with districts and schools, I always want to start with assumptions, meaning that we should already understand how a school functions, how a school is run, and be able to see where are our leverage points in the implementation process. And so with the assumptions, we have to understand that within a school, there's some kind of a school, a principal's cabinet. The principal already brings key members of its their staff together to have conversation about the management of the school. That's very common in many schools. It doesn't matter at what level, there's already that process. So let's be mindful that, that's, that that is something that already exists. How do we leverage that group? There's already, there's some kind of an instructional leadership team. Okay, that already exists. The instructional leadership team is gonna be very key as we begin to, to focus on the classrooms. And what does that mean? Okay, so, so that structure or construct already exists at many of our schools, some kind of an instructional leadership team. There's already some kind of a professional learning plan, either something that is done as part of the district-wide implementation or it's done at the site level in terms of what is our instructional or professional learning plan. What are the things that we're doing as part of our late starts or early releases? What do our staff meetings look like? What are our month to month release days look like? What does all that look like? That, that needs to be part of your inventory um, and also part to include in the conversations with the assumptions as to what happens. There's already some kind of a climate and culture plan. Many of you guys are doing or implementing PBIS. You have an MTSS process. All of those things are part of that. And so, and so we assume that there's already that, that that already exists. And then obviously some kind of an intervention in MTSS. So, so again, these are assumptions we need to make. Um, if, if they don't exist, 
I would argue that we need to be thinking about implementing some of these teams because they're going to be important as you begin to do the implementation for community schools. The other thing to consider or to think about that might be in place is there might already be some kind of a family and community engagement position. It could be a face, family community engagement specialist, or it can be a community liaison. It doesn't matter who that person is, but we, you know, most schools usually have some kind of, 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 of that role. Sometimes it's shared between multiple schools. Okay. So again, we have to understand that, that we're starting from that, uh, from where we're at. So it does that position exist? Yes. Beautiful. You know, we need to make sure that they're at the table. We already have established part agencies, partnerships with nonprofits partnerships with higher ed. Many times we forget our higher ed partners. They're critical to our success for community schools, okay? So think about all of the different partnerships we have. Sometimes the site doesn't realize that the district has partnerships. So how can the site tap into district-wide partnerships that are already established, okay? It's gonna save you time and it's also gonna save you a process because many times they have to be board approved. So again, thinking about already, and we assume that there's already established partnerships. And then the other thing we have to assume is that there's already some way to communicate. We already have two-way communication, meaning that we have groups that meet, that they have a way to, to, to publicize their minutes or a way to communicate with parents and parents communicate with the school. We already have this type of structure, okay? So we have to assume that this already exists and, and, and value and, and, uh, and really, uh, um, support uh, what, what we already have, the construct that we already have, okay? So let's start there. Let's start doing that inventory of the things that already exist that are gonna help support with the implementation. Next slide. Here's what I, another big takeaway for, for us. These are key positions. And again, they're, they're in the statue of the law, in the framework and all the literature around community schools. These are the key positions. The principal, I started with saying that that was super important. It's still really super important. The principal is key in this implementation. And um, you know, hopefully as we move forward, providing some professional learning for our principals is gonna be important. Um, so they don't feel like they're alone and, and they have other principals that they can collaborate with as well. But, but the principal is a key role in the implementation. The other key role is the community schools coordinator. We know that that's also uh, uh, one of the things that's in the statute in the four by fours, that the community schools coordinator is something that, 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 um, that should be in place. And it, within the community schools coordinator, their role and responsibility has to be defined, okay? And in some cases, you have a family community engagement specialist and you have a community schools coordinator. They do two different things. They don't do the same thing. And many times there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of overlap. It's not about working harder, it's about working smarter. And so we really have to be very con uh, conscientious of that role and what that role means. So community schools coordinator is gonna be very, very important. If you haven't hired your community schools coordinator, okay, it's important that you're very mindful in their skills that they have, in their ability to communicate, their ability to network and be able to, because they're gonna be communicating with staff, they're gonna be communicating with outside agencies, outside partners, they're gonna be coordinating. Uh, now, the implementation is not on them, okay? The imp implementation is on all of us, but that role is gonna be important to ensure that we're moving in the right direction, okay? So that coordinator is critical. The other key position and group that needs to be in place is your community schools advisory group. Um, we've already talked about it, and I'm sure you know that that has to be in place. And so being very intentional about how you begin that is going to be important, okay? It's easier to begin it well, take your time and begin it well, than to rush it and do it, and then have to go back and say, oh man, I got to go back and start over, okay? So be very, very intentional about how you're building your community schools, coordinating, uh, community schools advisory group. Um, your instructional leadership team is important. I already mentioned the classroom, the classroom, the classroom is critical for implementation of community schools. It's about, it's where we bring everything together. Okay, it's about that asset student focus, community focus, uh, uh, instruction and pedagogy. So your instructional leadership team has to, has to understand their role within that implementation. Um, your intervention MTSS team, 
this is where many of you are very strong in because you've been working at this for a long time with RTI, PBIS, MTSS, all of that. Uh, COVID taught us a lot. And so many of us started to build these services already. Okay, so that's a key group, again, as we're looking at the whole child uh, support. And then your associations. Okay, if you don't know this already, the California Teachers Association has doubled down on community schools. The NEA, the National Education Association, has doubled down on community schools. And so it's very, very important that our associations are at the table. They are sitting with us. They're planning with us. They're moving this forward. Um, it's coming directly from the CTA leadership. It's coming from the NEA leadership. And so it's important that we have them at the table along with our classified employees associations. Okay. So please, you know, be mindful that everybody's on board because it, it, you know, community school implementation affects everybody on our sites. So everybody's included in that. Next slide. Um, Two-way communication. Um, you need, you know, this is where the transparency comes in. People are going to be questioning, where's the money going? What are you doing? Why are you, the why? What, what, why is that person over there? Why is that? Everybody's going to be asking a lot of questions. If you don't communicate well, this is all going to fall apart. You know, one of the things that's in the statue from the beginning, it says, communicate, communicate, communicate. Make sure that there's an awareness about community schools. Make sure that everybody, under so, so that communication and that over communication is essential for the success. So when you think about your systems and structures, think about how you're going to engage. Think about how you're going to communicate to and from. If your advisory committee is talking about a certain, you know, item that they want to implement because it's important based on the data that you're seeing, based on all the information you have, and it impacts teachers, then you better make sure that that information is going to the instructional leadership team and back to the advisory committee. So thinking about how all your systems are going to be communicating is going to be important. If you have great systems, great, strengthen them. If you don't, think about how you're going to build them, okay? And this is with all your educational partners, including your parents. So with that, um, we're going to leave you with some homework. We're going to leave you with some work to do because, again, as I said at the beginning, every workshop is going to build on itself. We're going to be focusing on different parts of the framework. We're going to be focusing on different parts of the, of the capacity building. Um, and it's going to lead to you being very successful in your implementation plan, you being very successful in your, uh, your annual performance review. And so with that, um, we're going to give you um, we're going to give you some tools. But before we do that, I'm going to ask that you I'm going to ask that you do a quick feedback because I know we're getting to the end of our time. Um, so we're going to ask you to give us a little bit of feedback um, from the workshop so we continue to improve. We continue to meet your needs um, and 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 have fun. I mean, this is what this is all about, right, is having fun. Um, we know that the last meeting is going to be in person, so I'm looking forward to meeting all of you in person. Um, so please give us your feedback, and then I will close it with your uh, with your homework. And if you if you if uh, you are having trouble getting into the feedback, um, please let us know in the chat, and somebody will help you. We'll give you a couple minutes to give that feedback.
Like, so can you go back to the previous slide? Thank you. And if you're not finished, go ahead and finish the 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 uh, the feedback. Uh, we truly, truly value that. Um, so in the next step, and what we leave you with, it's really thinking about. No, no, no. Go back to the the that one. Yes, please. And then we'll skip back to the other ones. Um, we're going to leave you with really now building your your team strengths um, while identifying uh, um, and supplementing the areas of need. So what we mean by this is is now. For today, we already went through what are we currently doing. Um, you saw a lot of examples of great things that are happening. So we want you to be very mindful. And if you're at a site, this is where you bring your team together. If you're at a district, think about it from the district's perspective. If you're at a county, think about it from the county's perspective. What are we doing and what are we, you know, what are our strengths and where are the areas of growth that we need to have? And so we've created a tool for you to be able to have those ongoing conversations and to really build some really key concrete next steps. So if you go to the uh, to that slide, um, Alexa, two slides down, that one, okay? So we've created a tool to help you do that, okay? So so what we um, what what you will do is that you will, in the second column, so the first column is the exemplar. It's everything that we just talked about. What is community schools? What are the four yeah. pillars? And they're divided by the four pillars, okay? What you will do in the strains is you will put all of the great things that you're currently doing. I think everybody is requesting, I, I believe uh, um, Michelle or Alexa, they're requesting um, access. Oh, got it? Okay, thank you. Um, so in that first column, this is where you're going to put what you're currently doing. These are your strengths. This is what you, you know, we want to value what you're currently doing. So please be very extensive with your list of things that you are currently doing. This is your inventory. This is your baseline data. This is where you want to start from. And so you want to list as many strengths as it relates to each of these pillars. Okay. The next column is your needs, meaning that, that, that here's, here are those ideas that you didn't think about yet or you didn't consider quite yet. These are the ideas that, that you got from somebody within the group today that you say, you know what, I think I wanna do some of that. Or now that we frame what each of these pillars are, I wanna think differently about how we're approaching this. So in that second column, this is where you're gonna be putting all of those needs. And so what this will be doing is this will become your action plan, okay? This will start to become your action plan. This will start to evolve. Remember what I said, be very intentional and methodical about, about your next steps, but you have to have a plan and you have to be guided through that process. And so utilize these tools to guide you into those clear next steps. Um, and so one of the things that I always like to do, so when you have those needs and you, you have that list set, the next slide, Elise, I mean, I'm sorry, um, Alexa, uh, in the next slide, um, here's where you will be, you know, just thinking about it. Don't tackle everything, but think about what is that low hanging fruit that we can take care of now that we can start to implement. Color code them, say yellow, use whatever color you want, but think, say, you know, these are the things that are low hanging fruit that we can start to think about in, in, in implementing. Okay. There's things that are going to be much more you know, they're bigger. They're part of the, the implementation of the grant. There's there are things that are going to take time. They're going to take two years to accomplish or three years to accomplish. That's okay. They're going to continue to be part of your action plan. Okay. So, so as you start to, to look at the, that, those, that, that column, the need column, you're going to start to identify what is your short-term goals and what are your midterm goals and what are your long-term goals. Okay. It will be, it will be helpful. Now, remember, this is an ongoing process. So, so it's it, you know, you're gonna keep revisiting it. As you begin to do your needs and assets assessment, as you begin to create priorities, everything starts to align. Okay. Everything starts to align. Again, community schools is about alignment. It's not about doing other things. It's not about adding things to your plate. It's about alignment. And so be very mindful that everything that you're doing is aligning. 
Everything you're doing for your SPSA and your LCAP should be aligning to your community schools implementation. Everything you're doing to, to raise achievement should be aligned to your community schools implementation. Everything you're doing for MTSS and student supports and all of the interventions, all of that is aligning to community schools implementation, okay? So hopefully one of the big takeaways you take away from today uh, is that that community schools is not more work, it's focused work and it's focused on the right things. So with that, I leave you with um, just again, going back, reviewing some of these materials, using, using the resources that we've given you. We also have given you a lot of really good tools that you may wanna take away and use. Um, not only the tools that we're using today, but also uh, there's some resources that we've outlined for you that you can also take away. Complete your self-assessment. The last page in your self-assessment, this is really important. The last page in your self-assessment includes your current stuff. What are you currently doing in terms of district initiatives? What are you currently doing in terms of your professional learning plan? What are you doing in terms of MTSS? There's a place there for you to do that. And so again, it's a current inventory and it's also, it's also a baseline, okay? You wanna document that. You wanna document, this is where we start. When you're, you're gonna be asked to look at growth, this document will help you measure that growth because this is where we started. Guess what? When you do this again, six months from now, you're going to see the changes. You're going to see the growth that you've made and the impact that you've had. Okay. So all of this is foundational to that plan. Okay. Our next uh, meeting coming up, Foundations of Success, um, Crafting Infrastructure, Effective Community, community Schools Implementation, we're gonna go into uh, a, a little deeper into some of these concepts and, and, and continue with looking at the framework. Um, but again, uh, I'm looking forward to that. I wanna thank the, uh, I wanna thank the Monterey County Office of Ed for your leadership and all your support in community schools implementation. This is great work uh, that we're all you know, embarking on. And so I wanna thank you for your leadership in that and your support of all of our schools and districts. Um, and I wanna thank all of the participants that were here. Thank you for your time. And hopefully this was meaningful for you. Um, and so here, is the, um, here are the resources that I mentioned. Uh, the PowerPoint is embedded in there and there's also resources for you. We're gonna do that at every workshop. We're going to leave you with the PowerPoint and the resources so you, you'll have easy access to them as we, as we move forward, okay? Thank you so much. Appreciate you this afternoon and hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you for being with us. And we will stay on if you have any questions, personal questions. Um,